Disclaimer! The following episode contains spoilers for Cruella. Don't go crying to your mum if we spoil it for you. You've been warned. Welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. And this week... Yeah, what she said. We're talking about Cruella! Cue the music! Hello there, capers, and as I said, welcome to Pod Capers, the official podcast of a place to hang your cape. My name is Scott James Meridu, and this is a show where we talk about various geek and nerd related topics, and are joined each week by a very special different guest. It wouldn't be a live action Disney movie without Mark Russell. Say hello, Mark. Hello. So, yeah, a Cruella de Vil origin story. I mean, we all knew how this was going to go, because let's be honest, the Disney live-action train has been pretty consistent in the part, appearing at Awful Junction and Terrible Station and, oh my god, what were you thinking? Junction. Other word for a train station. Like, it's just, End it's been line. awful. It's, <laughs> <laughs> we could go on. Aladdin, The Lion King, the oh. f- Beauty and the Beast. They're all just so fucking awful. And now, and now we've got one that's actually okay. Hmm. What a surprise. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I went into this movie expecting, oh, well, let's see what shit they've cooked up for us this time. And imagine my surprise when about like, like, like a quarter of the way in the movie, I caught myself and I realized, am I into this? (laughs) Is this going well? Well, well is a strong word. It's, you know what? We're going to get into all of that, all the highs and lows of this movie. But before we do that, we've got the news. Uh, first up on the list, it's not spectacular news, but it's still worth talking about. After many uh, delays due to COVID-19, A Quiet Place Part 2 has finally been released to positive critical reception and quite a bit of money in the box office. So are you going to go and see it, Mark, have, assuming you haven't already seen it? I'm afraid I've not seen the first one. It's kind of on my list of films that I still need to watch. I mean, they're good films, but like they're horror films, so it's not really my bag. But no, no one can deny the importance of the original movie, what it meant for the horror genre, and also for great representative representative casting. Actually, casting casting a deaf actor as a deaf character that's something that's really good. John Krasinski proving in addition in addition to being amazingly funny, surprisingly ripped, and just an all round decent guy is also a great director. What the fuck, like? Yeah. Get, you can't be John Jack Ryan and like a great director. Stay in your lane, John Krasinski. Or better yet, just pick a lane. <laughs> pick a lane, any lane. Mm. But nevertheless, it is worth talking about uh, Quiet Place Part Two being released in theaters Yay. because it means people getting back to the theaters. Uh, the film we're going to be talking about today, Corilla. I actually went to uh, Michael Cinema for the first time in fucking months. I didn't. I did it. I did the stupid thing and bought it on Disney Plus. And I shall admonish you for that later, but sticking with A Quiet Place, um, it's good that we're getting people back into theatres, assuming, of course, you're taking necessary precautions, keeping COVID safe, and uh, adhering to necessary protocols. And also, it's, it's interesting to point out that the disparity between COVID safety protocols in different countries is very apparent in cinemas, because in England, uh, at the very least uh, in Cineworld cinemas, which is the... Uh, Cinema, cinema that I usually go to, uh, you need to keep two seats empty between each person. And that's in England, though. In Scotland, it's three seats. And that tells you a lot about fucking England. Sorry, Mark. Thanks. <laughs> you haven't left us yet. 
<laughs> give us time give us fucking time <laughs> anyway uh so yeah I, I highly recommend that you go out and uh, you don't have to see a quiet place part two but go out and support your local cinema and try and see films if you can uh as long as you are safe and the cinema has appropriate measures in place so that's that uh, next on the big news ticket item we've got jesus christ never thought i'd fucking say this in my life <sighs> Amazon have bought MGM. Oh, God. Mark has his head in his hands, folks. This is not good. Like, like it, it, it cost them eight fucking billion, well, over eight billion. And I don't know if it's entirely a done deal as of the time of this recording. It probably will be by the time this episode goes out. But yeah, it's uh, MGM... Metro Goldwyn Mayer, one of the oldest film studios in existence, has now been bought by fucking Amazon. Amazon and God, I mean, this is this is what our life is going to be like. We are going to enter into the corporate war between fucking Amazon and Disney, which are these two great entertainment monoliths battling each other out, and we're going to be caught up in their wars. Oh, I mean, come on, this is okay. MGM has kind of been. A minor studio for a few decades now, but come on, it was basically the progenitor of all other film studios. It created yeah. the Oscars, I should mention, or at least the Academy. And, and for that, they must be destroyed. Exactly, I suppose. But they've also created some of the greatest films of all time. Uh, you know, the, and a whole bunch of James Bond. And a whole bunch of James Bond ones. <laughs> and now suddenly. I thought that, I guess, the strange thing was I had it in my mind that they were owned by Warner Bros. But that's just a Ted Turner classics, and so now they've been bought by fucking Amazon. I know. I assume it's just a you know shop all the films on Prime. It's like hey, hey, look at us. We're not. We're we're better than Netflix. You know, <sighs> first of all, better than Netflix. Yeah, and exactly. And exactly. I mean, honestly, at this point, when it comes to streaming, six of one, half a dozen of the other, you know, you pick your favourites and then just move on. But here's here's what I... Here's the thing. The American government has been talking for a little while now about breaking up the big tech companies like Google and so on and so forth. Why are they not discussing the same thing with film studios and entertainment corporations? Because that's what these companies are doing. They're trying to build monopolies. And... As anyone who knows anyone about capitalism will tell you, that's rarely a good thing, if ever. Mm, exactly, because I know just because there's a board game centered around it doesn't mean it's a good thing. If, indeed, it's kind of like the the worry now is okay. Is okay. Amazon's bought MGM. Who's gonna go next? Are uh, they gonna be? Because you know, like Warner Brothers are kind of their own thing. Universal's their own thing. But are uh, is everyone else? Lionsgate's off in the corner, like twirling its hair through its fingers, like, ooh, I wonder who will pick me for the spring cotillion. It's gonna be hungry, hungry hippos for film studios. <laughs> God, yeah, and so, yeah, it's a dread to think where this is all gonna go. Is this is um, yeah, this is not good news. I mean, it might not be terrible news, but it's not good news, at least not right now. Mm-hmm. Moving on now um, to casting news. Uh, it seems like there's been a lot of casting news recently, but this is worth talking about. Aaron Taylor Johnson has been cast as Craven for the Hunter, Hunter for an upcoming Sony film. I guess Sony is still pushing her forward with this whole Spider-Man villain universe thing, despite the fact that, and I cannot overstate this, nobody cares. Like, I'll turn up for Morbius because I like Morbius. He was always more of an anti-hero than anything else. Mm. But no one fucking cares about a Craven the Hunter movie without Spider-Man. And they're not going to have Spider-Man in it. Let's be honest. If they couldn't get Spider-Man for Venom, they're not going to have it for Craven the fucking Hunter. Exactly. Because is it kind of depressing that Carnage is going to be in a film before Craven is? I mean, this whole thing is depressing, and no matter which way you look at it. And also, it's also the fact that Aaron Taylor Johnson has already been... He's already Quicksilver. He's got to be Craven too, and you know he's going to do the same accent. They recast Pietro again? And also, why Aaron Taylor Johnson? Like, I don't think he's a terrible actor. He's not been in that many good things from my perspective. Like, okay, so he's a Quicksilver. Okay, that was pretty good. And he was Kick-Ass. Yeah. yeah. Kick-Ass... Quicksilver and Craven. What's what's going on with this alliteration bullshit? It's, but, it's quick kicking Craven. Okay. Uh, here's my question: 
why him? He doesn't have, I mean, maybe he has the acting chops to play Craven the Hunter, but he doesn't exactly have the same physical type. I mean, when I think of Craven the Hunter, I think of like your Ron Perlman's, your Jeffrey G. Morgan's, your um, uh, Josh Brolin's, uh, maybe even John Hamm, people like that. <laughs> you know, and then you've got Aaron Taylor Johnson, who's fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, him. Just really him for Craven the Hunter, the big, you know, broad chested, hairy chested, rugged, square jawed Sergei Kravinov. <laughs> like, did, did you see the guy from that fucking Godzilla movie he got eaten off screen as Craven? <laughs> <laughs> maybe i suppose i could imagine i suppose anybody could be imagined otherwise apart from uh, aaron tiller johnson as craven yeah no, just... maybe, maybe he'll grow into it he'll buff maybe it maybe maybe he'll do one of those big like you know johnny depp uh, transformations where he just like oh he's like almost unrecognizable maybe maybe <sighs> What would that movie even be about without Spider-Man? Well, a big game hunter? Like, who just, like, I travel all the world taking out, out exotic animals. And it's like, wow, the kids are really going to like this guy, because that's what people want to see, you know, their film protagonists. Trophy hunters! I expect they might do it kind of like what they did the 90s a- animated series that kind of made him a, a normal bloke and he got superhuman powers. He became a bit more beastly and then she'll see who is more stronger the beast or the man and for some reason i'm now talking in a russian accent i do not know why yeah but uh speaking of uh villains in main protagonist roles that maybe shouldn't work out as well as they could do cruella <laughs> this film is quite good da, 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 da. <laughs> I mean, I, I, let's be honest, I feel comfortable, more than comfortable saying that this is the best. I mean, okay, so I am aware that they were Disney live action films, you know, before this, based on their animated properties. But in terms of this recent block of Disney live action adaptations that started with Maleficent, this is, bar none, the best one. Not that saying much. <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I mean, even as I said, like, when, when you're working against, you know, Live action Lion King slash not live really a live action Lion King. It's not a magnificent hurdle to have to jump over. Yeah, just but walk around it. <laughs> yeah, just walk around it. But here's the thing: barely have to step over it. But nevertheless, it did make a leap and more or less landed on the feet. Let me put it this way: I went into this movie like here's me on the scale of caring. I'm at zero. I had <laughs> zero expectations. And yet this movie kind of impressed me. Hmm. It has its flaws. It has its drawbacks. But ultimately, kind of giving away my opinion in the very beginning of the the episode, I guess. Right. I'm glad I saw it. What did you think? Uh, Well, it it took me by surprise. Because, oh, okay, here we go. Another dizzy romp that's going to fill all the cliches. Speaking of villains that come from cold corporate decisions, here are some ads for you. Check them out. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Okay, so, Cruella. That's, God. Because let me put it this way. I went to this movie like... Here's me on the scale of caring. I'm at zero. I had no expectations, but this movie still impressed me. I'm glad I saw it, and I never thought I'd say that about a live-action Disney movie. And this movie has a lot of hurdles to overcome. Not from the previous live-action Disney movies, but from the previous live-action Disney movie. Okay, so before Maleficent, there were occasionally a live-action Disney movie, and they ranged in terms of quality. But I think we can all agree, the live-action 101 Dalmatian movies, because there were two of them, were fine. Average. Average. I mean, Glenn, I mean, Glenn Close is amazing in them, but apart from, he put her to one side, and maybe Hugh Laurie as well, everything else is... Oh, look, you cast Eric Idle as a parrot. My God. What? 
<laughs> what is everything every idol does? I, it's because, is it was so cast weird. on this because I think this was at the same time that George of the Jungle, or people still talking about George of the Jungle, maybe, and that had. Um, no, no, no. That's why he was in the yeah. Dudley Do Right movie because John Cleese was in the George of the Jungle movie. Mm. So, so I don't know why. Oh, okay. There's no reason why Eric Idle was the parrot in Goddamn 102 Dalmatians. Otherwise, thinking about that, that movie sort of impressed me as well because it had a really unique twist, something this movie that we're talking about today doesn't actually have. Like, Cruella Deville's machinations and, like, her manipulations of all the people around her in that movie were surprisingly clever. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, and like, it was a really good plan that <laughs> was surprisingly brilliant in 102 Dalmatians. What the fuck? R- writers, why did you suddenly go the extra mile for this yeah. movie? Eric Idle, Parrot, we do not need your A material. But they were fine. They were fine. John Hughes directed the first one, at least. Did you read the second one? Uh, it might have been Kevin Lima who also directed the Goofy movie. What a fucking bizarre connection! I might. Oh, I God, yeah, it's... <laughs> I mean, they were they were absolutely fine, perfectly charming movies. I actually think I prefer them to the original animated uh, 101 Dalmatians, just because they had not more personality necessarily, but they were less rough around the edges and more clearly defined in what they wanted to do, uh, which was apparently slightly rip off John Hughes's arguably most profitable work, Home Alone. Like, ooh, let's get Cruella de Vil and all sorts of contraptions and stuff. And yeah, that's what they wanted to do. But okay, fine. The standout, as you said, was Glenn Close as Cruella de Vil because she was Cruella de Vil. Like, remember how in X-Men The Last Stand, everyone talked about how Kelsey Grammer was Beast? Glenn Close was Cruella. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, she was just completely inhabited this weird cartoon character and brought her to life in live action. And can we just talk about how great Glenn Close is? I mean, she's an mm. executive producer Which on I, this I, film. Was, I, I was surprised for like two seconds to see that in the credits, but then I was like, oh yeah, no, of course she would. Of course she would, because she can do anything. And then exactly. we get this, I mean, yeah. So this is an origin story for Cruella. <sighs> so... Hmm. Well, no, we don't need any of these live-action Disney movies, but they're going to keep on doing them. I mean, actually, I'll tell you the back. We do need them to fix the previous movies that I hate, except they don't fix them. In if, in, if anything, they make them worse. But here's the thing. The only other one of these that I've seen, I still need to see that Pete's Dragon movie, that I thought was mostly tolerable Yay. was Maleficent. Uh, I haven't seen the second one because I just don't care. Hmm. Here's the thing, though. The Maleficent movie was bad, but I get what they were going for. They were going for a Wicked-style vibe, you know. Ooh, let's do an alternate thing where we see that this person that we thought was bad was actually good. Here's where Maleficent fell down, though. Uh, They tried to have their cake and eat it, too. They tried to show this person's Maleficent's villainous side whilst making her the good person. And I'm sorry, you can't make her the good person because you included the scene where she literally cursed an innocent baby. Good people don't do that. If if you're going for a villain or you're going for a misunderstood hero, there's no way to misunderstand cursing a child. That's a pretty fucking clear message. Exactly. I mean... I suppose Cruella kind of pulled off the whole revenge Oh yeah, now, because here's, here's the thing. This is, what I'm, this is what I'm aiming at. Cruella takes a similar idea, you know. We take this person who you know, is presumed a villain and portray her a different way. And in that way, it succeeds far better than Maleficent because, spoiler alert, in this movie, she does not kill or... A, well, I was about to say, or kidnap. She does, in fact, kidnap some dogs. But she does not kill or attempt to kill a bunch of dogs. The thing that makes her a villain is not portrayed in this movie. This is both why it works and why it doesn't work. Because what we've got here is a Cruella origin movie without Cruella de Vil. 
because how can I put it this way? Disney is terrible at writing villains as protagonists. And you can have a villain as a protagonist. You don't need to be a hero in order to be the protagonist of a movie. You can be a bad guy. But Disney want to play it safe. They don't want to, you know, do of all this moral ambiguity or like, oh, we can't show the main person as a bad guy. So what we get is we don't get the Cruella de Vil. We get a Cruella de Vil. Glenn Close was the Cruella de Vil. This is a Cruella de Vil, which is fine, but it's, it's, I respect sincerity of purpose, and I'm not really getting that from this movie. If their purpose was to show the origins of this villain, they failed. If their purpose was to show a different version of a villain and show that she wasn't actually that bad, then they succeeded, but that's not the impression I got. Did you get a different impression? Uh, well, the problem that I have with this movie is, is, like you said, they don't exactly show her evolving into the iconic villainess. And there's a, there's a point in there where she actually laughs at the idea of killing hmm. puppies and coat out of them. So, where, so if this is meant to be a prequel to 101 Dalmatians, where along the line does she f- decide to say, I know, I'm going to murder dogs and wear them as a coat? Where does she click in a mindset that she's going to This is not so much a fall slaughter? from grace as a portrayal of someone rising to reclaim her place in the world, which is fine. That's not a bad story to tell. But this links to a much deeper flaw with Disney. Their inability, or at least not inability, their reluctance, and this is not as evident in this movie as it has been in other movies of theirs, the reluctance to write female protagonists or female characters in general as flawed they did that with yeah, Mulan. Exactly. They did it with Ray, and they've done it with a lot of others in recent years. And again, it's not as pronounced in this movie because this character clearly does have flaws, and she's got a very interesting character, in fairness. But they are just so afraid. And ultimately, it means that this movie succeeds in spite of itself. Uh, there's a lot of criticisms directed yeah. towards the screenplay. I think most of that is warranted. Not all of it, but most of it. And there's lots of other um, there's lots of other problems, to be fair. But lots of other good stuff. It's been compared recently, uh, in the last uh, couple of days, to the Joker movie. And I think that's a, f- I think that's a fair <laughs> comparison. But that doesn't mean that they're on the same level. The Joker is an infinitely better movie than this. But I understand why people are making that comparison. It's just... You know you know what we're going to do? You know what we're going to do? We're just going to fucking start talking about it. So, we begin with that oh-so-not-dated of uh, filmmaking techniques... The narrator thing. Oh, I'm narrating my own life. This is the story of how I died. Yes, I'm sure. And here's the thing, you know, they start off with that, but here's the thing. It was a, it was way too into the movie before I realized, oh, that's Emma Stone narrating and not an even older version of Cruella. It was, um, yeah. okay. Yeah. And in fairness, that's the only big problem I have with Emma Stone's performance, just as a performance. I've got other issues relate, revolving around her that aren't her fault, but we'll get into that as we go on. So it starts with Corella describing her birth, and I'm just like, wow, we're really going back to the beginning. And it turns out the half-black, half-white hairstyle that she's known for, that iconic do, that's all natural, baby! It's not a dye job. It's, it's just... It's just her hair. Yeah, that, that was quite a surprise. He's like, okay, how is she going to get the hair? Oh, she's born with it. Okay, they're not doing the. They're not doing another different origin story to explain her hair. We're just. She's just born with it. Okay, and right, I, I, I actually, the minute I said I, I, it wasn't until about quarter of the way into the movie that I realized, oh, I'm actually having a good time with this movie. But the first instance that in my subconscious I realized, oh, this might be quite a good film, is when. Uh, 
her mum is taking her out amongst the village in her pram, and a neighbour looks down at her and goes, ooh, that's unfortunate, isn't it? And walks away. And I thought to myself, my God, that's the most accurately British thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, you just know that a British, you know, slightly out of touch middle-aged person in living in, like, the rural part of Britain would say something like that. I don't know, I know a couple yeah, of people it's, speak like that. It's just like, <laughs> okay, you people, you know, okay, filmmakers, you know what you're doing. And then it's we see her growing up a little bit to uh, a slightly older child who I swear to God doesn't blink entirely in the movie. She's just like, her eyes just open <laughs> all the time. And you see her terrible contacts to Mac Gemma Stone's eye color. Just like, oh God, <laughs> demon child. Here's the thing though. Watching you from underneath a rock. What's that from? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's not the song. I, <laughs> you've come to realize. You've I only know the first bit. Like, Cruella <laughs> Devil, Cruella Devil. <laughs> anyway, uh, it turns out, though, this is not Cruella Devil, but rather Estella Miller. That's right. And Ooh. she is a okay. precocious child, to say the least. She's very interested in fashion. And doesn't like things that look ugly. And her mum shows like a knitting pattern or something that she's got up and says like, no, that's ugly. And she's just like, oh, what an incredibly cruel thing to say. Your name's Estella, not Cruella. Well, uh, uh, that was grim. <laughs> yeah, this is the first of many bad lines of this movie <laughs> that is balanced out with a lot of good lines, but... Subtlety is not this film's strong suit, and that's both a strength and a weakness, in fairness. My God, it, this movie is just like Corella's hair. It's just duality, you know, pros and cons, an, an endless yin and yang of failure and success. Anyway, and um, she gets taken to a really uh, posh and upcoming school where she really does not fit in where she also meets a young Anita Darling. Ooh! And I was I was so worried that she wasn't going to come back into play later on in the movie, but she actually does, but we'll get to that when we get to that. And uh, eventually gets expelled for causing too much of a ruckus, uh, including at this one point, finding a dog in a bin that she names as a buddy. Yeah. And buddy. that's another thing. Corella likes dogs in this, Especially this dog buddy, who's with her the entire movie, and um, is kind of pointless okay. for the most part. Yeah, I mean, when did, I kind of couldn't tell when the dog was real, when the dog was CGI. Well, that, that's, like, that's, that's the thing you bit. see. Uh, the dogs are using this are uh, for the most part CGI. I'm actually in favor of this, and I'll tell you why. Yeah, and things like um. The what was it called? The Wild? That movie with Harrison Ford, where the dog was CGI, based on the uh, Jack London oh, novel. Um, I hear that. That freaked me out. That dog. Like, but I'll tell you why. Dog? Because dog. whilst uh, most filmmakers these days make every single effort to make sure that a dog or any sort of animal that they work with on a film is taken care of and is treated humanely and everything like that, you're still making dogs work like that for a film. I personally would really like it if, whenever possible, they could use a CGI dog. Admittedly, I thought the CGI in this movie was pretty damn good. I know some people that may not be as good, but I much prefer a fake-looking CGI dog to a real dog potentially put into harm's way and being forced to work on a film. I think that's better for animal yeah, that's rights. Fair. That's just me. Mm -hmm. that, that's but fair, yeah, that's the, the, that doesn't mean the dog needs to be in the fucking movie. In fact, there's... <laughs> There's one dog that needs to be weird. in this movie, like, uh, technically four, but we, yeah. we'll get to that when we get to that. And point is, she Come gets here. expelled, and the guy from the Alice in Wonderland movies, you know, the overacting posh guy, is like, oh, you don't belong in this. Yeah. <laughs> you know that. This Again, we're going back to the duality yeah. of this movie, because there's some really fucking great, really naturalistic performances in this movie, and then there's fucking cartoons. And it's, it's, it's like this movie has two directors, mm -hmm. one going balls to the wall insanity and one going really down to earth and gritty. And these styles clash. It's really, really off-putting. Uh, but anyway, they're on the way to London. They have to move because of, you know, the whole school thing. 
I'm not entirely sure why, but anyway. I think she didn't have a, I think her mother didn't have a job. Then how did she pay for anything ever? Like, Who knows? Uh, no, no, no. Anyway. And um, they're on the way to London, but they make a stop off at this little place called Hellman Hall. Now, I'm not up on all of Corella's backstory, but even I recognise that. Wait, isn't that Hell Hall? And, that seems familiar. and it's a it's a cool uh, thing, and you, you immediately you know people who know that sort of thing will, you know, understand what that means. But this leads to another problem in the movie. It's something that I've called solo syndrome, i.e., it's an origin story that has a lot of getting the iconic stuff crowbarred in. And that's not to say that we... I mean, yeah. I understand why they include this stuff, like Helmut Hall later on, her car and stuff like that. I get it. I do. That's not my issue. The issue is the way they do it. It, Like I said, subtlety is not this film's strong suit. It's crowbarred in. It's clunky. And it could have been done a lot better. Um, but anyway, she's at this, at this Helmut Hall. There's a huge party going on. And she gets in a bunch of trouble and a bunch of dogs, Dalmatians, in fact, chase her outside. Then she hides behind a hedgerow while her mum is talking with this mysterious figure out on a cliff edge. And then the dog, the Dalmatian, fucking punts the mum off the cliff. And I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I mean, on the one hand, it's a very dramatic scene. And, you know, it really hits you right in the gut when the mum falls off the cliff with a scream. And it's just like, oh, my God, no, Estella's mum. Oh, this is awful. And then you remember that she got fucking punted off the cliff by a Dalmatian. And you want to laugh your ass off. My God, I don't know what to feel. Give me something to work with, movie, because that is so sad and so stupid at the same time. I, I, I mean, what were you thinking? It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. It doesn't pay off. It's weird and off-putting. It's it's the most bizarre death scene I've seen in a good long while. I mean, uh, I was I saw this in the cinema. There wasn't a, it wasn't a packed cinema, if I'm being honest, because it was pretty early in the morning. But there wasn't any gasps and there wasn't any laughter. I got the impression that most people really didn't know what to think. <laughs> we go into the afterlife of busy parents. Mufasa's saying to Lady, so how did you die? Uh, I got pushed off a cliff by Dalmatians. Oh, I got pushed off a cliff by my brother. Did the, did the Dalmatians say, long live the no, king wait. too? <laughs> no, they barked. Oh my oh. god, it's so stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. So, so Bambi's mom, what are you in? I got shot. <laughs> <laughs> did the shooter say, long live the king? Stop asking that, Mufasa! <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, Estella then runs away from the party, jumps onto this very convenient driving away tr- lorry full of rubbish. And while all while the person that um, Estella's mum was talking to is saying like, oh my goodness, she was trying to shake me down. And I'm thinking like, oh, that's Emma Thompson. Oh, she's going to turn out to be the villain, isn't she? <laughs> Just because you don't show her face doesn't mean we don't recognise fucking Emma Thompson's voice movie. She- <laughs> God, anyway. Side note, Emma Thompson, stop being in Disney stuff. Stop it. You have filled your quota. Some of it was good. Some of it was bad. You're done. Do other things. You know? Treasure Planet. Okay, maybe do that again, but... <laughs> what is it about Disney that keeps bringing <laughs> her back? Do they just love her that much? I don't know. So, uh, Estella runs away and somehow ends up in fucking London and immediately oh, runs away yeah. to... I think, I think, is it Regent's Park? It's a fountain that she... Yeah. Go on. Yeah, that's the weird thing. That's the thing. Her mom mentions, like, we'll go to Regent's Park and have tea there. And then the truck conveniently stops right outside, outside the park. And I don't know if it was at traffic lights or anything, but the fact they just conveniently stopped right outside the park. Lorry so driver is just like, off. hmm, this seems like a thematic oh. place to take a quick break. Uh, she immediately <laughs> runs to the fountain, <laughs> yeah. and uh, this becomes a recurring thing. She keeps on uh, going there. 
And um, I don't know why she wanted to go in the first place. She showed up like a picture of it earlier in the movie. She's like, can we go there, mum, and have tea? Like, I mean, okay, but why? But uh, uh, She just wants to, I guess. And then she but laments the fact that her mum is dead. Next morning, she meets <laughs> baby Jasper and baby Horace. It's... <laughs> And they are played by two very bad child actors, but still. And they end (laughs) up uh, going on the run from the police. And it was useless cop ever. And and, uh, she ends up in their hideout, like this big, huge flat thing that they hide out in for like 10 fucking years. Even though I don't buy that it's 10 years, (laughs) because all of these actors look older than 10 years have passed. Like, they couldn't have been more like more than 10 or so, 10, maybe 11 or 12 in uh, the past. Mm. Flash forward, according to uh, Estella, 10 years later. No, all of these actors are older than early 20s. Like, late 20s, I could maybe buy. Early 20s, new, new, not buying it. They're on the 30s, actually. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I mean, Emma Stone can pass it off, but the other two really can't. It's, yeah. And, which means that dog is really, really fucking old. Both of those dogs. There's another dog that with them Super called dog. Wink, um, who's in fairness is a sweetheart. Love Wink, but yeah. uh, like that's a little Chihuahua dog. How long do those live? Not much longer than ten years. No. Anyway, probably not. This is Disney. Dogs don't die in Disney unless mm, you're old, exactly. unless you're old yellow. And. So she hooks up with them, even though uh, they didn't like her at first because uh, she lost her mum. And apparently Jasper and Horace are both uh, orphans as well. And yeah, this movie kind of makes us care about Jasper and Horace. I never thought I'd see the day. (laughs) And then she ends up dyeing her hair red and we flash forward to the present where they're like a lovable band of artful daughter type thieves they're like pickpocket people <laughs> while uh, Estella makes their costumes you know I, I, ma- I imagine they could just buy the clothes second hand she doesn't need to make them I imagine like the fabric and like, the time needed to make all that sort of stuff would be more cost prohibitive than just buying the clothes out of a charity shop Probably, but they, Quella probably needs to explore her creative zest. Presumably. And then <laughs> it's her birthday, and as a present, Jasper uh, gets her an entry-level position at this famous department store. Now, it's at this point we need to mention that uh, originally, uh, when we first started, it was the 60s, and now it's the 70s. So this is all taking place in 1970s London. You know, the whole fashion chic thing exploding everywhere. So it's very much a period piece. And it's because it's in the 70s, of course we have to have the soundtrack absolutely crammed to the fucking brim with every single song the 70s ever made. Everything must be in there. Although I'm, and I will say this, I'm very glad they did not put London oh God, Calling yeah. in there. I'm so glad. Every, every time there's a film in London, they will instantly play that song. It's like, okay, we get rid yeah, of fucking it's, London. I mean, there's... There's plenty of good songs in there. I mean, they're all good songs, in fairness. But it's it's this trend I've been noticing. I think a lot of people, in fairness, I'm not alone in this, have been noticing with the film industry of late, just jamming all the songs in there. Just like having huge budgets for licensing these songs. And I blame Guardians of the Galaxy for this. Even though they had a really good, you know, story, thematic reason for having those songs in there. Now everyone's copying them and just jamming the film full of these songs because they know that people like these songs because they're classic songs and will therefore associate the movie with the songs. And it's just a cheap psychological tactic to make us like the movie. And honestly, at first it's fun, but inevitably it becomes a little bit obnoxious. A little bit. And so, and she, and Estella is really, um, really grateful to Jasper for um, for giving her this gift. And Horace is like, yeah, but like, what's the angle? There is no angle. It's just, and and this is where we get into, um, so we know Emma Stone is playing Stella, but Jasper is played by Joel Fry, an actor I've never been particularly f- a, a big fan of, but I thought he was really good in this. And <sighs> Horace is played by Paul Walter Hauser, who is also a very good actor. 
His accent is terrible in this. He's American actor doing the worst sort of since Dick Van Dyke accent ever. Apparently, he <laughs> based it a little bit off of uh, Bob Hoskins in Hook. Yeah, like no, it, it's awful. I could barely understand what he was saying half the time. It's, 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 it's terrible. I like. I can give Emma Stone a pass. Not this guy. I'm sorry. He's a very good actor, and in fairness, he is good in this. Just the accent is terrible, and it's like, no, cast a fucking British guy. Jesus Christ. Anyway. <laughs> and so that's going on. And so she ends up um, going to this department store, Liberty Department Store, and there's this big, long shot going through the whole department store, like the back and the front and all these different people, and ends with her you know, scrubbing a toilet. And this is where we get to another two problems with the movie. Uh, the running time, it's too long. It's too long of running time. They could cut stuff. And the cinematography. Now, the cinematography is good, but we did not need one big, long tracking shot going through this entire fucking department store just to end with her cleaning the toilets. Like, I get what you were going for. She thinks she's going for, like, this big, fancy new job. You know, like, low level, but still fancy. And ends with her clearing toilets. Wah, wah, wah. But couldn't you just smash cut to it? This is this is self-indulgent, yeah, is what I'm saying. I think it would, have been, it would have been funnier if they had her having her moment of relation and it cuts to her in the toilet. I think yeah, like I get funny. what they're going for, but some of the cinematography in this is just, it's just a bit too much. And she's not really happy and she keeps bugging her manager, yet another cartoon cutout, for a, another job. And I'm sitting here thinking like, she's had this cleaning job for like, what, a week? And she's already asking for like, Day. can I please design Day. dresses? Like... I get that's a dream, but I don't blame the manager for fobbing her off. Exactly. I mean, you when you when you go into a new business, you usually start at the bottom, unless you have quite a good CV, and that, then you build your way up. It's just like how it works in in yeah. a working environment. And... I want you to remember this whole sequence of events, like her talking with this manager stuff, because I'm going to come back to it later. Um. She uh, gets really frustrated and ends up one day drunkenly fixing the uh, the window display of the dress. Uh, she thought it was really, really bad, and then um, she drunkenly fixes it and is about to be fired. But then the Baroness shows up. The Baroness, being the owner of the department store and having her own fashion line, is like this big, big, huge fashion icon. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I love this sort of thing, even though she doesn't say it very much. And uh, basically hires on Estella as a, what would you call her, a fashion designer, maker person? Yeah, fashion designer, and she kind of builds her way up to becoming her PA. Does she really build up to that? I think she just gets, sort of gets automatically made her, made that, even though the Baroness already yeah, has a PA. Good. Again, another cardboard cut cutout. But yeah, yeah. Here, here's, there's a big, long, extended scene where, like, her and Horace and Jasper trying to evade the police while all that's going on. And again, just get to the fucking point, would you please, movie? And at this point, we need to talk about Emma Thompson's performance. A lesser actor would have overplayed this to the point where it was obnoxious. Emma Thompson manages to find the balance somehow. I think if this was if this had been done in an animated movie, Emma Thompson's character would have kind of elevated herself to the classic Disney villains. Yeah, she's kind of got that vibe to her. But it's live action, and so Emma Thompson knows how to play the comedy against mm -hmm. the seriousness. She's like this really hard, cold, cruel Machiavellian fashion designer. I don't know why I needed to, you know. Put fashion designer on the end of that. That was that much was pretty fucking obvious. Called a Machiavellian fashion designers. We know this. So she ends up uh, working over there and designing dresses, and it turns out to be a really interesting job. She's getting to know you know the world and forms a bit of a connection with the Baroness, and then she sees the Baroness's necklace. Now this was a 
quote, family heirloom that um, Estella's mother, I keep on calling her Estelle in my mind, which is Estella, um, <laughs> Estella's mother had and was just like, this is a family heirloom, you know, and she accidentally loses it at Helmand Hall when her mum died by Dalmatian. And then she sees it around the Baroness's neck. It's just like, what? Why do you have that? And she's like, oh, this is a family heirloom, but it was stolen by someone. But thankfully, I got it back. Uh, Estella then proceeds to act as suspicious as possible, clearly hinting she's got a connection to that person, but manages to not entirely give the game away. I guess the Baroness is kind of stupid when the plot needs it to be. And basically, oh, so I was just like, oh my god, like, my mum was not a thief, I don't know what's going on there, but I am getting that necklace back. This is the first of many plot twists surrounding Estella and the Baroness. It wears a little thin after a while. Not to mention most of them weren't No, necessary. you could co- combine, like, there's, there's three major plot twists, Rap plot twist number one. You could combine two of them into one, just like just easily. Yeah, but no, they have to space it out. That's half of the problem with this movie because of the long runtime. They padded out with all these extra plot twists, and they all. I wouldn't mind so much if it weren't for that that they all play out exactly the same. Revelation about the Baroness involving my family. Explain that to Jasper and, Ho- Jasper and Horace. They act sympathetic. We concoct a plan for revenge. Rinse and repeat three fucking times. So. <laughs> And point. okay, this is where oh uh, god, and so she basically makes a plan with Jasper and Horace to do a big heist to get back the um the necklace, and to do that, she realizes, no, I can't be Stella, I need to be someone else, I need to be Cruella. This brings us to another not so much. I keep on saying this, but it's another fault of the movie, but it's also one of its strengths. Um, this whole idea that when she was a kid, her mum says, now remember, don't let Cruella out. And I'm just think- sitting there thinking, don't talk to your kid like that. Don't pretend like her, you know, childish antics are like a different personality persona. You know, that's going to mess your kid up. But that's exactly what happens. And she thinks of herself now as... As Cruella. She's adopting an entirely different persona. And they could have built up to it a bit more. They built up to it when she was a kid. But then we have a huge stretch of the movie where she's acting as Estella and not Cruella. And we could have built up to it a bit more. And this is this is what I was talking about with um, Emma Stone's performance. And also that se- the, all those scenes with the manager. Because when she's playing Estella, Emma Stone is very uh, naturalistic for this kind of movie, at least. She's, you know, very down to earth and you can tell you get what she's saying. And she seems like she could be, you know, almost anyone except for, you know, her actions. I'm not saying it's a bad performance or anything. It's very good. But it clashes with her Cruella performance. Then she ups, like, the plumminess of her voice and starts calling people darling. And does She very much becomes Cruella Deville at that point in terms of her mannerisms. And that's very good. But it clashes with Estella. And I get what they're going for. They're trying to show how different she is when she's being Cruella. I get that. I do. But... It feels like two completely different characters in a bad way. You need to set this up. Hence, when she was talking to the manager, she acts like frustrated and, you know, miffed. What she should have been was trying to show how barely she restrained she was from completely destroying this man. And that's not what came across. It came across (laughs) as like someone who was understandably frustrated and not someone who was plotting his murder. In trying to show that she was restraining herself, she came across as so restrained, she feels like two completely different people. Again, it feels like this movie was directed by two different people. And it 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 doesn't work. Like, okay, so at the very beginning of this show, we used a you know a a sound clip from 102 Dalmatians. It's the scene. The whole point of that movie is 
Uh, Corella Deville has voluntarily undergone psychological conditioning as part of her probation in order to get a reduced jail sentence for, you know, stealing a bunch of dogs and trying to turn them into a coat. As a result, she's suddenly become very nice, very sweet, and actually a, a, a bores violence towards animals, in fact, loves dogs. However, there is a way to undo this psychological conditioning, the chiming of Big Ben. And this happens contrivedly so right about uh, halfway through the movie and then we get a huge scene with glenn close slowly turning from ella as you know in that movie to cruella and it's very much a case of like like her shoulder pads pop out she like starts growing her nails it's very like sort of <laughs> werewolf in london but cruella de vil but it's it's showing the transition showing how like this person Corella Deville was just hiding right below the surface. <laughs> That's not what we get in this movie. It's like a a sw- but here's the thing. That whole sequence in that movie took place over, you know, a couple of minutes or so. It was a real build up like at first we just hear like in the background of fake choir, Cruella de Vil. And then she just like goes wildly around, like reeling on the street. She doesn't know what's happening to her. And then she sees every single Londoner around her, black and white, dressed like Dalmatian spots. The buildings are black and white. The cars are black and white. Her butler, played by Tim McHenry, is black and white. And it's it's a slow, long, drawn out process, and that's not what happens here. She's just like, I want revenge, so I'm going to be Corella now. Boom, I'm Corella. That's my long winded way of saying that the whole transition thing wasn't very handled properly. Yeah, it's a bit. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I like her entrance where she becomes Corella, but. The fact that she the kind she kind of embraces Claire as her true self, and she's putting on an accent while doing it. But her dramatic her dramatic darling accent when she's acting as a Stella, she's talking normally. So which is her real self when she's Yeah, I mean there's this thing um I mean this thing in linguistics called code switching and this has sort of been appropriated as sort of like this idea like we act different around different people. How we act among our friends is not how we act amongst our parents and other family members and things like that. So we do hide parts of ourselves from certain people and then let those parts out in a certain situations. So this is not unheard of. This whole thing could have worked. They just needed to build up to it a little bit more. Like, have her call people darling and then earlier in the movie and show that vindictive mean streak. But then she tries to, like, clamp it down. Like, no, no, don't be Cruella. Don't be Cruella. And it's like, imagine if you cut out her entire child for the movie. I'm not saying that would be good for the movie, but let's say you cut that out. Her turning to Cruella would come right the fuck out of nowhere, even if she had, like, a throwaway line saying, oh, when I was a kid, I had a little bit of a mean streak. So people, like, my mum called me Cruella once as a joke. Like, even if you established it, cutting out the childhood makes the whole Corella persona just come right the fuck out of nowhere. And she sticks to it throughout the entirety of the rest of the movie. And now, like, oh, Estella is gone. That character you knew is gone. Now we've got Corella. It's an entirely different character, an entirely different performance who portrays herself in an entirely different way. So, yeah, it's, it's a lot of faff when we didn't really need a lot of faff and we needed just a little bit more build-up. I mean, who wants the rug swept under them at a moment's notice like that? Speaking of which, here are some ads! And we're back. Okay, so... uh, She and Horace and Jasper plan a heist to uh, get the uh, necklace at uh, the Baroness's black and white ball. It's a big, huge heist movie thing. And I thought, is this going to be the rest of the movie? Oh, no, we've got a ton of runtime still left. What are they going to pad this out with? And the heist doesn't end up going particularly well, especially when it's revealed that the Baroness is holding, like the, having the necklace on her rather than it being in the vault, despite the fact that it's a red jewel necklace. And the whole point of the black and white ball is that there was no color. But hmm. admittedly... <laughs> And this is when I realized, oh, this movie has problems, but it might actually be a lot of fun, is when Emma Stone turns up as Cruella de Vil uh, at the ball. 
she like is wearing this like big gown thing sits on fire and they established that earlier by having her like like Horace like play with some flash paper like magicians use and it burns off girl on fire style to reveal her red dress um it's <laughs> like this movie knows its showmanship it's not afraid to be stylistic from this point on and it's really good at it yeah, I think this, despite what we've just discussed about the whole build-up, I do think her entrance as Cruella is definitely one of the better parts. Yeah, of the she's... <laughs> you can tell Emma Stone had a ton of fun playing this role, much like Glenn Close. She just has this presence and this stylishness that is so Cruella de Vil. Like, it's so recognisably Cruella de Vil, even though it's a younger version and arguably a different yeah. interpretation. It works, you know. It, it works really well. Hmm. Bit, I suppose because the the character is quite dramatic and hammy, so you can go a bit more. Yeah, out there and because she's inhabiting this fashion world where ostentatiousness is the name of the game, it doesn't feel out of place. Uh, so she arrives at the ball, and the bouncer's like, hmm, you're intriguing, even though I throw people out of my parties for, like, mildly sassing me, so... But you can stay, because you seem like to have protagonist vibes. And they sit down and have a little bit of conversation, and the heist goes incredibly wrong, and they back the uh, fuck out, out of there. And while they're trying to escape, the Baroness uses her dog whistle to summon the Dalmatians. This is where we get plot twist number two. It turns out the whole Dalmatian punt kicking her mum off a cliff was no accident. The Baroness deliberately summoned the dogs and pointed at the mum in order to get them to kill the Baroness. Weird murder plan. What if she dodged? You know, what if the dogs didn't, you know, <laughs> shove her wily Coyote style off a cliff? What if they tried to maul her? Uh, and, you know, what if she ran away? You, A lot was banking on this one person staying right there. It's the most inefficient murder plan I've ever seen, even though it did work. And, again, rinse and repeat. Cruella gets, has a revelation about this, tells Jackson Horace, doubles down in revenge. And... Hmm? Although, they do steal the car. They get the car. Yeah, they do get the car. The I didn't recognise that it was... I mean, I recognised it was like, ooh, that's a bit Cruella de Villish, but I didn't know it was the actual car. Yeah, well... The well, they, they, they did alterations to it uh, later on in the movie, yeah. And um, also, it's po yeah. worth pointing out that at this point in the movie, we also see uh, Anita pop back up. She's now a photojournalist for a newspaper covering uh, the event. Uh, she's played by... Uh, what's her name? What's her name? Kirby Howell Baptiste from uh, Barry slash The Good Place fame. She's pretty damn good in it. Uh, I, I, she's got a very down to earth sort of naturalistic sort of vibe in most things that she's in. So I was worried that she wouldn't be a good fit in this movie, but she did fit rather well. I thought she was really good, mm. in fairness. Better than they portrayed Roger. Oh. Why do I don't know why they put, put Roger, Roger in this. In this. I mean,. I wouldn't mind, except it's the way they introduce him. So, okay, so I bear in mind that I am not a huge fan. Like, I don't think it's terrible, but I'm not a huge fan of the original 101 Dalmatians uh, movie. So, Mark, how would you describe Roger in that movie? Very laid back, easygoing, not all that high strong. He's quite modest in his life. He's got his dog. He's got his piano. But he's still, a, you know, music. assertive oh. and strong opinioned and is he's not afraid to show his emotions, correct? Yeah, he's you know he's a slightly falls into the bungling department, but he's quite yeah. you know when he puts his foot down with some like uh, he, yeah he does yeah he puts in this movie down. he's a fucking wet blanket who just sort of takes abuse from everyone and <laughs> oh yeah he oh so he's, he's introduced as the Baroness's lawyer and she's like this is Roger my lawyer although he prefers right. to spend his time playing piano in a dingy jazz bar and that's it like again it it's not okay, what right, they sure do mind. it's oh. how they do it it's crowbarred in it's clunky it's awkward and it's like it doesn't help that the actor doesn't look uh a lot like how roger really ought to look like kirby howard baptiste 
uh, does a great job looking like Anita, even though she's got a different ethnicity. Uh, the guy they got to play Roger not only just looks different, but also just holds himself differently, like how you would imagine Roger would. Um, Jeff Daniels did a better job, is what I'm saying. I mean, the, the bloke looks like he just kind of walked on set. <laughs> like, right, he you're does on. a little bit. Where am I? I'm Roger now? Okay, <laughs> I'm also, Roger. And also a weird thing I noticed, in the original film and the uh, 90s film, his last name is Radcliffe. Here, for some reason, his last name is Dearly. So you've got Anita Darling and Roger Dearly. Is this a Lady in the Tramp reference, or where are they going with this? Um, I mean, let me let me put it this way. I feel the sickening threat of brutal honesty, and I'm wildly uncomfortable. No one cares. Moving on. Thanks, Nathan Lane. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he's introduced like that, and it's it's really clunky and embarrassing. Uh, Anita's uh, introduction is much better handled. Uh, so Corello and Jasper and Horace escape, and basically they des- they decide that um, okay, so here's what we're going to do: full on campaign of revenge, and we're going to show her up at every single uh, appearance she makes, and then we get. Please be a montage. Please be a montage. Please be a montage. A montage of. Corella showing up at all the Baroness's events, outstarting her, giving her showmanship, trapping her in her car, stuff like that. <laughs> it's a really fun part of the movie, if I'm being honest. It's very lady... Uh, some of her, I'm not a fashion expert, but a lot of her dresses are very Lady Gaga-ish in terms of execution, how she does it. I mean, they really, really did go all out with the costume designing. I don't know who did the uh, the costume design, but give them an Oscar, because they're like, really good. I like the garbage dress one. I like the guy. The guy was, was good. I like the one where she turned up with like the face paint on her face that spelled out the future. Oh yeah, that's quite clever. That was really clever. It's just like ooh, personal dig against the Baroness. It's it's really it's. <laughs> I just I love the sass. I love sassy characters sassing each other. It's it's a lot for lot of fun. Question why the Baroness doesn't up up security in this place? But I guess. Three people are able to completely bamboozle them. <laughs> uh, God, and at this point, we're what halfway through the movie. Yeah, roundish, roundish, and it's just like okay, so we were just pretending one story. Now we're telling a different story. Now we're telling a different story. Now we're on to yet another different story. This movie goes in stages uh, rather than like the traditional three act structure. It's you need a little bit of stamina, if I'm being honest. I could see why kids would get a bit bored at some point in this. Like, it, it gives you another, like, jolt of adrenaline right into your arm at various intervals, but then it starts to drag again. This is the problem with the uh, long running time. Um, and Corella starts building up her own brand uh, by contacting Anita. who's just like, hey, you want to help me out here? And she's like, eh, yeah, sure. Baroness was mean to me in one scene, so why not? Although... During all this, is Cruella actually selling anything? No. How is she paying for all this? That's a very good point. I guess she's making it with thievery. Uh, she's also getting it... Okay, so she takes over the, the flat they're living in, like the abandoned flat, and recruits uh, a friend of hers that she met in a uh, small shop. Um, What was it? Art. Art. Or R-T. As in work of. <laughs> How subtle. Uh, played by uh, John McCrae. And I love art. Hmm. Art's great. <laughs> I mean, it's probably about as close to an openly gay character in a Disney movie as we're probably going to get without them saying that they're gay. Probably. Well, they did. They did. <laughs> did they say that he was gay in the movie? Oh, well, it was after John McCrea said he was gay, and then, you know, I guess Disney... Oh, know. yeah, oh, yeah, oh, no, no, open actors, absolutely, characters, is what I meant. Yeah, yeah I do believe they, they announced that he was the first gay character in a live-action Disney film, so they've done it again. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what's that, the 12th what? openly gay character in a, in a Disney movie that isn't actually saying whether or not they're gay, but... Oh, look at us, look at us, look how trendy we are, give us a pound of that, no! Yeah. Uh, but I do love the character, and I do love John McRae's uh, performance 
uh, of him because he's got this whole like Ziggy Stardust thing going on. And they do acknowledge the fact that in 1970s London, there are people who are, so we say, less than tolerant of people who might dress a little bit different. And, you know, it's very clear who he is and he makes no apologies for it, nor does Corella ask him to apologize. And they get on really well, really quickly. And he's just a delight. He's a really delightful character. Seems a bit too willing to go along with her plan of criminal vengeance. But, you know, so is everyone else in the movie. Except, of course, for Jasper. And I'm just going to say it. Jasper's a bit too nice in this movie. Mm, I did notice that. He hasn't got that more sinister edge to him. He's not unwilling to... He's, this time... He, if someone asked him to lock an old lady in the bathroom, he'd probably say, well, I don't know, that might not be a bit right. Yeah, and I don't begrudge the film, their interpretation of Jasper. Uh, I get it, he's like the moral conscience of the group, but it's not really what Jasper was in the original, and I, I, I would be, I'd be... I'd be more pissed off if Joel Fry did a worse performance with it. He doesn't, he gives a very good performance. I really like his performance. Again, it's just... This isn't really the character we know of. And people who might actually care about that character would be even more angry. I don't, so I'm fine. <laughs> and he's just like, oh, I really don't like this. I prefer Estella, not Corella. They repeat that line several times in the movie through various people. It gets really annoying after the second time. God. And uh, they, you know, go on this uh, campaign of vengeance against the Baroness, including kidnapping her Dalmatian dogs because one of them swallowed the necklace. <gasps> and they were just waiting for it to pass. And all you need is a good football game in order to tame an aggressive dog. Yeah, like they watched the football game with Horace. It was just like, OK, they're, they're nice now. <laughs> and this is this is where we get like, there's a little bit of a sinister undertone in the movie. It's just like, ooh. Is she going to skin them? Is she going to kill them? They're Dalmatians. They killed her mum. How old are those fucking Dalmatians, though, by the way? They were fully grown ten years ago. My God. But, meh. And <laughs> they make reference to it. They make jokes like, hmm, you make a very fetching coat. You wouldn't. No, I'm joking. We'll come back to that later. Hmm. <laughs> And, by the way, they kidnap the Dalmatians absurdly easy. Yeah, like, they, just, they just run out of... They, like, I can't, they, get, they get Wink to lure them into the van, that's it. With a, through an open door. Yeah, through an open door. What so dog groomer has an open door when you're grooming dogs that might bolt? <laughs> Jesus um, Christ. That anyway. That's like this is very quickly. Hmm. And, uh, oh, th th then, this shows, this is when the movie gets really clever, because it shows Cruella's machin machinations, like her manipulative side. She um, do, pretends to go on a lunch bake and design a dress off, off, you know, off in a spare time, knowing that the Baroness would find out about it. Baroness finds out about it, just like, oh, this dress that you designed, it's mine now because you're on my property. Yeah. And she's like, okay, I guess I'll make this dress for you, but I'm not happy about it. Then she gets like a bunch of beading in from uh, a delivery man. Oh, it turns out it's Horace. What's going on there? And she makes this, uh, I don't know anything about fashion, so I don't know if the dress looks good, but a supposedly magnificent dress. Baroness is like, ooh, I like this. Then she gets Jasper and Horace to break in and get seen breaking in. It's a whole extended comedy scene where they try and wake up the guard. It's actually quite funny. And so the Baroness is like, okay, that's it. We're putting all of these dresses in the safe. Then it time, comes time for the spring fashion show featuring all these dresses, but they can't get in to the vault. They try and break in. They eventually manage to break in and a whole bunch of like locusts fucking come out of or moths rather i think they're probably moths come out of of the vault having revealed to be hiding within all these little pellet shells that were on the dress eating the entire fashion line and everyone like screams and goes round while the baroness is just like standing there stoically like oh no and everyone runs out right outside to corella's own fashion show <laughs> with jasper like playing like a bunch of punk songs on a guitar that he apparently just knows how to play seemed like a Lady Gaga concert like you said and I'm just saying and thinking 
My God, that's genius and vindictive. This is what people would want to turn up for. This is the cruel, manipulative genius of Cruella de Vil in place. And you know what? I didn't see it coming. I didn't figure it out, even while it was happening. Maybe some other people did, but not me. Maybe I'm losing my touch. Who knows? But I just thought, movie, you know what you're doing for once. And I respect you for that. Yeah, because I thought they were going to do the old, oh, we somehow drilled into the vault and taken the stuff from inside routine. But that was that really blew me away of how utterly fantastic <laughs> right U-turn. Yeah, it was... <laughs> I mean, the Baroness is just like, Oh no, this is much worse. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> you could see in the Baroness's mind, just like, well, gonna have to kill a bitch. <laughs> because uh, then there's a whole thing with like Jasper and Horace and Estella breaking up, like, oh my God, you're just two different people now. But it cuts to her going back to the flat, and it turns out the Baroness has got a bunch of her security henchmen tied up Jasmine Horace, carts them away, and said, Oh, yes, they're going to jail for your murder, because I'm going to burn you alive. And Corella is eventually saved by the Baroness's. Um, Butler? Valet? I don't know. John, played by Mark Strong. And. <laughs> And it's just like, okay, so a couple of things. First of all, holy shit, I get the Baroness is, uh, you know, a little bit out there, but she's really resorting to murder? Like, brutal immolation murder? But then we remember, oh yeah, she killed Estella's mum. That's who she is. But also, like, her security guards apparently have zero problem with this. No, I'm just like, what, we're, we're going to burn her alive and frame these two for murder? I didn't sign up for this. I'm just, I'm just a security guy. I'm not a gangster. What the fuck? <laughs> None of them object. It's really weird. But then it turns out John, uh, the valet, who's been sort of a side character, he and Estella met when they were when she was a very young kid at that party where her mum died. Um, and turns out does have a problem with that. He initially appears to be a cold, brooding sort of man, but then it turns out he's actually a little bit nicer than we thought. I like Mark Strong. The guy keeps on getting portrayed as like villains and like cold hearted people, but he's got range. Mm. And he takes her to his home where he gives her the third plot reveal. The Baroness is Cruella's biological mother. The only reason why this is in is so that Cruella can inherit her estate. As soon as I realized, saw Helmut Hall, I thought like, ooh, how's that going to play in there? Is the Baroness going to take her under a wing and then bequeath it all to her? Make her, her uh, Corella her heir? No. Turns out that she already was her heir. The Baroness had her, was did not want to get pe- pregnant, and as soon as she gave birth, instructed her valet to kill the baby. Assuming that he would do that. Most valets would do that. I remember that one Jeeves and Worcester episode where Bertie Worcester <laughs> commanded Jeeves to kill an infant and was, you know, Jeeves was like, mm, very good, sir. No, it doesn't happen. Stop assuming that people will do crimes for you, Baroness. You're not the godfather. <laughs> and, and it turns out that Mark Strong instead, just John the valet, just gave it to Estella's supposedly biological mother, actually adopted mother, to raise and take care of. And that's why she was going, went back to Hellman Hall that one time to basically blackmail uh, her real mother, her biological mother, to give them money. Otherwise, she'll expose her for what she did. Mm. And it's again, we go for the whole revelation thing. Like, this could have been combined or cut out or mess- handed, handed another way. It's kind of pointless but it leads to the best scene in the movie Uh when Corella in a fit of passion and rage and grief and confusion goes to the Fountain of Regents and has a conversation with her dead mum that she's had before in the movie and Emma Stone gives a fucking phenomenal performance goes through all these emotions 
seems to be right on the edge of madness, but doesn't go over it, doesn't overplay it. She doesn't ham it up. She doesn't tune the scenery. And then she goes back into vulnerability and insanity and rage and grief. All in this maelstrom of active emotions. And the camera does not move. It just stays planted squarely on her face. All we've got for the scene is Emma Stone's performance. And it's fucking amazing. I'm clapping yeah. so you can hear me. <laughs> Huzzah! A man of quality. Yeah, no, because it, it's so good. And she, like, rages at her mum for not telling the truth. Says that, oh, she is like the Baroness because she's a psycho. And that means I'm really, truly Cruella. I'm brilliant and a genius and a little bit mad. And then she softens a little bit and says, but I still love you, though. Still mm. love you, mum. And it's like, oh, my God, this is great. Yeah, I know. And- to, find, to find, you know, to find that humanity within... Disney villains is just, you know to, you know to find it. Yeah, There's, if you if you take all the all the charisma, all the wackiness away, then you find what the person is like beneath. Then that is good storytelling, good writing, and above all, good acting. It's really good acting. Like really, like it's worth the price of admission alone. This two three minute max sequence of her just talking to a fountain where the camera doesn't move. It, it's fucking phenomenal. Go and watch it if you haven't already. So she then try she then busts uh, Jasper and Horace out of uh, jail wearing a fake mustache, <laughs> fooling not? no one. Look out! That incredibly pretty man with the wonderfully sharp cheekbones is getting away. We sure it's a man? Well, of course, mustache. Obviously, he was wearing mascara. Hey. If that guy with a mustache wants to wear mascara, that's his. We do not judge in the 1970s. Anyway. <laughs> and uh, this is where she, she supposedly completes a transformation, becoming Cruella for good, but she does break, uh, you know, she does make peace with Jasper and Horace, takes them to John's house. <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, We ran out of crumpets. Yeah, it's, it's a whole thing. And it basically constructs her final revenge against the Baroness, uh, including all her friends so far, you know, Jasper, Horace, Anita, Artie, John, all these people, to break into uh, the charity gala and expose her. How are they going to do that? First, they convince all the attendees to dress up like Cruella, black and white hair, so she can blend in. And it's, I love it. It, I it's love so it. cool. It's I love so it cool. I was cackling like a madman, like, yes! <laughs> I just, you can start to see the Baroness's um, sort of... Ex- exterior crack. Yeah. This is where we get to a problem with the movie. So, okay. Uh, this movie is clever, and its portrayal of the characters at this point in the movie is great, but... They are way too liberal, and I say dismissively so, with labelling the Baroness, and by extension, technically Cruella, as psycho. Mm. Unlike the Joker movie, this is not a fantastic portrayal of mental illness. Mm. It's We don't know if the whole Cruella thing is a case of disassociative identity disorder, or if it's just, you know, a performance, or her real true self... And the Baroness is just portrayed as, oh, she kills people because she's a psycho control freak. That's literally the phrases they use. And I'm sorry, life's a bit more complicated than that, and you have a responsibility to portray it as such. I'm not saying that you can't show mentally ill people uh, committing crimes, doing violence, or killing people. You can do that. It's not necessarily... The best kind of thing, and I would mu- I'd be much prefer to see stories about mentally ill people who are the heroes and who don't do that sort of thing, or even better, even better yet, uh, stories about mentally ill people that aren't necessarily just defined by their mental illness and things like that. There's so many different aspects of that sort of representation that we need, and so you you can portray them like this, but that doesn't mean you should, and it's it's just a bit too easy and dismissive and I'm not a big fan of it as I'm saying I'm not a big fan of it 
so nevertheless, uh, we see the Baroness's veneer start to crack. They infiltrate uh, the whole scene. And we're not going to describe it in great detail because we want you guys to go and see it and see how good it is. But it ends with Estella putting back on a red wig and meeting the Baroness at her cliff and revealing, I'm your daughter. The Baroness is just like, yes, of course, it all makes sense now. Why you're so much of a genius. Why you're so special, of course. And... She's like, you gave me up for dead. And she's like, and the Baroness is just like, I'm sorry, it was a mistake. I clearly made a mistake here. Could I give you a hug? And this is just like, eh, sure. Meanwhile, Jasper and Horace and all these other people have been rounding up all the other party goers and taking them out to the, to the cliff to watch all this. The Baroness has not noticed the crowd of dozens upon dozens of people walking along a gravel path right behind her. When none of them speaking, none of them talking, just like, hey, what's going on here? I don't know. Is it like a performance piece? Yeah. Like, none of them see, none of them speaking, none of them make a sound. I guess these are all ninja fashion people. <laughs> Baroness does not notice. And then the Baroness is just like, push. Whee! And. And it's just like, oh my god, they killed Corella, except we know that she didn't. Like, I know she... Just because you say earlier in the movie, via narration, that the, the character who's talking dies, doesn't mean we necessarily believe it. You know, unreliable narrators are a thing, movie. We're aware. And it turns out later on that Corella had a parachute in her skirt. <laughs> um, n- n- no? No, movie. No. Just that. As someone who was actually, you know, parachuted out of a plane. Yeah. Parachute? Yeah, yeah. I, I did a tandem skydive uh, for like my, was it my, um, yeah, it was my 18th birthday. Wow. Scott, you're the bravest person I've ever known. I, I think people who don't tandem skydive are significantly braver. I wasn't doing anything. But parachutes, the big things stuffed into big sacks. Like, they're not compact. Not even, like, the small, like, micro element ones. Like, no. And also, where did she get it? Did she make a parachute? You can't make a parachute. Not in the 1970s. Sorry, no, you can't. It's, it's, it's just weird. It's weird. Although I do recommend tandem skydiving. It is an awful lot of fun. You know, the ride-up is terrifying, but downward is very, very fun. Nope. And... Nope. Nope. Just <laughs> and so... She parachutes down to safety where horses are like a boat. And the Baroness turns around, sees a whole bunch of people. And she's like, oh, she tripped. She, she tripped. You saw her tripped. She was trying to blackmail me. And she tripped. No one's having any of it. Like, we saw you push her. And then she gets arrested. And it's quite satisfying, if I'm being honest. Not, not as good as Coella's arrest in the 1990 film where she's stuck in the van of the skunk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they could have had, like... I. She kind of goes a little... The Baroness goes a little bit too meekly for my taste. I I really wanted to go crazy, like a hair go askew, and Emma Thompson just to fully let loose, and she didn't really do that. No, no. You want her to see her kind of, like, snap, but even then she kind of, like, goes off, like, I'll give you a review. Somehow, feebly. Oh yeah, this is like that's Corella's line. It's you pigless, no. you fools, you idiots. No, not not even that. It's yeah. yeah like, and then it's oh. revealed that they, even though they don't have a body, they bury Estella, and apparently Estella made an alteration to it. Well, made a will where she left her entire estate, which is now the Baroness's estate technically, to her good friend Corella Deville. No one right. questions this. Not one person questions this. Which... Like, the, no, neither the lawyer nor the police question. Okay, so we know the Baroness put this person on the cliff. Uh, we cannot find the body. And said body mysteriously, very recently, left all of her fortune to the Baroness's worst enemy, Corella de Vil, whom we have no record of until now. Plus, when did she have time to make the will? Yeah, it's... It, it's. There was a better way to do this. This was not it. 
And still sticking with the Corella persona, she now turns Hellman Hall into Hell Hall. Very on brand, in fairness. And just like, ooh, now the fun begins. And then we get a pop song version of uh, the Corella Deville song before a credit stinger of Roger and Anita getting Pongo and Perdita, which I from Corella, by the way. She sends them to both of them because... Okay, it's, I get why she sent it to Anita, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Apparently, well, halfway through the... like Later on for the movie, after telling uh, the Baroness there's no legal way we can strike out against Corella, the Baroness fires Roger, and he apparently blames Corella for this and not the Baroness. I don't get it. And then later on in that, that stinger, he's like as a way of apology, despite the fact that she ruined way more lives than just his, she gave them more puppies, Corella gave him Pongo, hmm, and he starts making doing the song Corella de Vil. Corella de Vil. And it's just like, no, she's not done anything warranting this vitriol from you. It's the Baroness. What the fuck? And this is the note the movie leads off of. They have made it very clear that Corella is, you know, mean and vicious and a little bit mad, but wouldn't actually harm animals. Like, she still keeps those two dogs, Buddy and Wink, and the three Dalmatians. Hmm. She's, she just has those now. Presumably that's where she got the Dalmatian puppies from, what? And... This is what I'm talking about. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. They wanted to, you know, show this character as uh, the protagonist, but weren't willing to show the actual character. This is not Cruella de Vil. This is a Cruella de Vil. One that would never actually turn a bunch of puppies into a coat. I don't believe that at the end of this movie. So it's an origin story that's not really an origin story. It's like if they did the Joker movie and they decked him up in all of his Joker gear but didn't have him kill anyone. In fact, say, oh no, I never laugh maniacally and kill someone. That would be ever so impolite. Hmm. And it's like, no, that's not what we turned up for. We turned up for a Corella movie. What we got, was definitely mixed, was still good... But diehard fans of Cruella de Vil who are hoping for something that shows the true villain aside of this character are going to be disappointed. People who want a new interpretation of this character as an anti-hero, I guess, will be pleased. Which is more than we can say for something like, again, Maleficent. Because that tried to have its cake and eat it too, but didn't accomplish either. This tries to have its cake and eat it too, but only succeeds in having the cake. Which is better than nothing, but... You know, we were promised that we could have cake and eat it, you know? Yeah, I mean, like, it's kind of, uh, you're trying to wrap your head around, like, so are they trying to set up 101 Dalmatians? Or are they trying to make Cruella a little bit more humane? Are they, is it inevitable what she's going to do? What, what, where are you going with this? Because at the end of the movie, I don't buy that this character would ever do that. Even with yeah. more character development. I, I've heard rumours of potentially a Cruella de Vil 2. Oh. And honestly, I would not be... I would not object to that. Mm, I suppose not, but... But is it, there's is, no... Is oh, God. No, Mark. None of these films are necessary. None of them are. But what matters is whether or not they do something good with what they have. Other Disney live-action movies did not. This movie did. It has faults. It's clunky. It's too long. Way too stuffed a soundtrack. Uh, indulgent cinematography, except where it counts. And when it does count, it's very, very good. And just clashing performances. And like I said before, feels like there's two different directors. But both of them are good directors. These are. This is a story of... You know, stuff that does not mix. But it's like, I like oil and I like water. So they don't mix, but we there's two things we like. It's it's a bizarre fucking movie, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. And that seems to be reflected in uh, the critical response. Currently, at time of recording, it stands at 70, 72% not tomatoes, which I think is a perfectly respectable score for it. Hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's... Not 
bad. I mean, when you get no. a high score, it's generally a good thing. Yeah. It's, let me put it this way. It is infinitely better than all the other live action Disney movies we've gotten in the last decade or so. And I can honestly say I would recommend it to both Disney fans and general audiences, but there are problems, there are faults, and this movie needed an editor or someone picking over the director's shoulder. Uh, it was directed by Craig Gillespie, uh, who's best known for uh, <laughs> doing the movie Lars and the Real Girl, where Ryan Gosling is in love with a sex doll, oh. and I, Tonya, which explains uh, the casting of uh, Paul Waterhauser. But that, that's a good director. He knows his stuff. He knows what he's doing. And I saw a... Okay, so the two people wrote the screenplay, but there's a whole bunch of people working on the story, and that shows. Lot, too many fucking cooks in the kitchen. I keep seeing this, especially in Disney movies, just way too many people, like a page, pages of people who work on the story that they have to credit. Some of them may have worked on the current draft that ended up being the movie. Others may not have been and may only involved in early stages. So you have to credit them anyway, even though we're not seeing any of their work on screen. But too many fucking people. I think Greg Gillespie could accurately be described as a visionary. I think that word gets thrown around a lot and is a bit pretentious, but I think that's accurate. I think he just needed one, maybe two people max to work on the story with him. And this movie would have a lot better. It would have been a lot tighter and a lot more focused and would have just established everything just a little bit better. Even if it still copped out and didn't show Glenn, uh, I need to call her Glenn Close, Cruella de Vil as the villain she is typically shown as. Uh, but it's missing that. I don't think the fact that they showed her as actually a half-decent person at the end is necessarily a bad thing. It's just a question of taste. For me, it was fine. For other people, it might not be, and that's a valid criticism. Hmm. Well, one thing I noticed is that one of the writers, which stood up, also wrote The Devil Wears Prada. Oh, I wonder why they were hired. Hmm, I wonder why. How interesting. Hmm. But it does has it, it does have those vibes, and in fairness, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. If you were making Cruella film, you'd want Devil Wears Prada vibes. That's a given. Mm, but you, but you know, thanks to you, I'm more of a jaded cynic than I used to be. Yeah, you know, I've corrupted you over the years. You know that whatever the end result of the box office or the or the review is going to be, you know, the one thing that Disney are going to take away from Cruella's success is, what other villains can we turn into semi-sympathetic anti-heroes? Because I suspect that the Lion King prequel that no one asked for is going to be about how Scar became a bad guy. Well, in fairness, that's a story I'd be interested in seeing, oh, but well, they're going to fuck it up. Oh, they, because... well, well, the canon version now is just not the whole, his name is, means trash or anything. His his new official reason to turn evil, as presented in the Lion Guard TV series, is that he was overly arrogant, he got scarred by Snake, and everyone made fun of him. And that's including Mufasa. And that's why he's now evil. Yeah, I mean, that's how most megalomaniacal usurpers get their start. Yeah, and you just know, I can see it now, that at some point they're going to announce an Ursula movie, which I wouldn't, which, you know, if they cast Queen Latifah, I'll be fine with that. They're probably going to do a Jafar prequel. Uh, we already have a Jafar prequel. It's called Twisted by Star Kid, and it's fucking hilarious. Yeah, well, you know, Disney, like, ever acknowledge that. They're probably going to do an Evil Queen prequel, even though they got they did Once Upon a Time for that. <laughs> <laughs> We've already go. got a Maleficent prequel, kind of, alternate retelling. of. This is what I'm talking about. I, I just got a horrible feeling that this movie is going to be the exception rather than the rule. Aye. It's getting good critical praise for the first time ever. It seems to be doing pretty well at the box office. I haven't really uh, checked, but it seems like it's doing all right. Uh, a lot of people are talking about it, and for both good and bad, and so it's getting a lot of buzz, and everyone seems to be focusing on a lot of the good parts, like the stylishness of it all, the costume design, and the performance. Apparently, uh, some people are talking about how good Paul Walter Hauser is in it. I think that's probably because those people aren't from fucking Britain, but anyway... <laughs> Oh, God. And then let's talk about the cast for a bit. Emma Stone, magnificent in it. Chef's kiss, moi. Uh, 
Emma, St- Emma, St- I need to call it Emma Stone. Emma Thompson is also really good. I mean, we already know that she's a fantastic actress. She can do anything she wants. Like an hell. Joe Fry, he, he's very laid back. I don't, I have issues with the character in terms of this interpretation, but it's not a bad interpretation. And his uh, performance, I thought, was really good. Very laid back. Paul Waterhauser, very good actor. Terrible wrong, ca- r- r- yeah, terrible accent. Wrong casting. Um. Emily Beecham was uh, Catherine Miller, Esther's uh, adopted mother. We don't see a lot of her, but she was absolutely fine. Could be Howell Baptiste. Isn't in it a ton? And I'm glad they didn't go down the route of that, that I thought they were going to do with her character, like making her reacquainted with her as a friend, and then she ends up betraying her and just like, oh, how could you, person I knew at school for a little while? I'm glad they didn't end up doing that. Uh Mark Strong, great as John. John McCrabbe talked about how much I love them as Artie. Uh, Roger Dearly was portrayed by Kaven Novak. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I haven't seen him in anything else, so I don't know. But my issue was mainly with the portrayal of the character rather than his performance, so not really his fault. And uh, oh yeah, and uh, Jamie Dimitriou as Gerald, i.e. the like the manager guy of uh, the Liberty Department store who's fucking weird and whose character seems to mainly stem from his hair. (laughs) Also, Andrew Long as Jeffrey the Baroness's PA, who just stares bug-eyed at people all the time, again, acts through his hair. (laughs) A pretty interesting cast, and the focus is supposed to be, is where it is supposed to be, in fairness. This movie demands a lot from you. It does require a lot of suspension of disbelief. A bit too much for my liking. But at its core, this is a good movie. It's got just enough going for it for me to honestly say that this is fun. It's a very fun movie. And I'm glad I saw it, despite its flaws. If anything, I find it a bit more fascinating because of its flaws. And maybe this is something that Disney can build on. They won't. They'll tarnish it. Because that's what they do. But... You know, at the very least, we got one good live-action movie out of it. Now, uh, before we go into our final, final thoughts, here are some ads. And we're back. So, Mark, final thoughts about Cruella? Well, it's better than Maleficent, I'll give her that. Yeah, but... You know, they're all, you know, out of all the live-action Disney remakes, I would say this manages to creep its way to the top of this Jenga tower that we mm. that they are building. You know, because if you kind of look back at all of them, these ones that we've done in the past ten years now, not all the... You know, okay, we, we've ranted and raved about them for, for a long time now, but they're not very good. This one just manages to make it over the threshold, thanks primarily to the acting and certain other aspects of the film. Was it necessary to make? No, nope, not really. Does it need a sequel? Probably not. Uh, does well, Emma Stone that's the just... thing, you see. Um, Emma Stone and Emma Thompson have both stated that they would like mm-hmm. to do another Cruella film. Of all things, in the style of The Godfather Part 2, using both young uh, Cruella, played by Emma Stone, but also old Cruella de Vil, played by Glenn Close interesting i mean if this movie can work even if it's barely maybe that can too that is however just a rumor and well like the, God, I, like the godfather godfather part two apparently yeah that's that's right. the comparison they made I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. I'm living in a world where there's a good live-action Disney movie. Anything's fair game at this point. And on that note, I think we're going to end this show. Thank you very much, Mark, for joining me today. You're welcome. And if you enjoy the show, Capers, please tell your friends. Shout out from the rooftops. And if you haven't already, go back and listen to some of our other super episodes. Like all the previous live-action Disney movies we reviewed, there's a ton. You can listen to the show on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, or at podcapers.com. If you want to get in touch with us, suggest show topics, or maybe come on the show yourself. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AP2HYC. Thank you very much to Dan Harris for our logo, the lovely microphone, the red and blue 3D glasses. Those are mine. And thank you for listening. 
This has been Pod Capers, the official podcast for a place to hang your cape. Cue the music! <laughs>